Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Systems Change Deep Dive podcast, where we're taking a systemic look at some of the greatest social, economic, and environmental challenges that we are facing as a global community, and also at the ideas and projects that have the potential to catalyze systems change. Uh, throughout this first season, we have been looking at the issue of carbon capture as a response to the climate crisis, and we've heard from experts from around the world um, working on different approaches and solutions from projects, leads implementing innovative technologies um, to carbon capture and beyond. So today we have with us Jean-Pierre Duplessis, the co-founder of African Data Technologies, a South African company working to enable simplified digital monitoring, reporting and verification procedures to enable mass participation in climate and impact funding, all the while unlocking innovative forms of regenerative finance. Jean-Pierre is an attorney with experience within credit, banking, and SMME development. And he's very passionate about using innovative finance to create scalable regenerative business models. So welcome, uh, Jean-Pierre, and thank you so much for being here today. Um, and I'd like to kickstart the interview with the same question that I normally ask, which is, what drove you to do this work and why are you passionate about it? Well, thank you, Carolina, and thank you for the nice introduction. Um, so, yeah, as I said, my, my background's in law. So um, I'm actually more of focused on social impact with my business partner, Vian Becker, is actually the, uh, the engineer with a big focus on carbon. But my drive was when I was out of Austin, and I was doing my articles as an attorney, which is a, a mandatory two-year period that you do to be admitted as an attorney. I just realized um, there is a real dearth of uh, a lack of information. And South Africa already in itself is a very unequal country. Um, a lot of people do feel left out by the system or left behind by the system. Um, hundreds of years of um, drunk down pressure of basically being um, perpetuated by current systems. So I just thought I need to make a big change in my life and really try and see how many people I can help. Um, I didn't do that immediately. I spent some time in the banking industry, like my buyer said. Uh, but then in 2019, we started African Data Technologies um, with a goal of really using data and technology to help um, South African communities. But then also to look at what funding is available in terms of South African um, law. So we've got in South Africa uh, innovative financing mechanism called broad-based black economic empowerment which is in essence a funding mechanism that's aimed at addressing um, the, our history of uh, oppression and i it's it's measured as an absolute number so it's measured if you're building companies uh, enterprise development is measured as a percentage of your net profit off the tax with no real measure of the effectiveness of the funding so that really was my drive to see how do we utilize Funding that's already being deployed and maximize that impact to so really start thinking about how do we create a greater impact with the funding that's already deployed. Yeah, thank you for sharing um, your your motivation to engage in this work. Um, and I kind of want to ask, since we are focusing on on carbon capture, and this is something that is quite big in the work that you do, how you are approaching uh, this issue and what your proposed, let's say, solution to it. Absolutely. So, um, yeah, as I said, looking at what are we spending funding on in any way and how do we do it more effectively? So in South Africa, we've got a big issue with um, invasive plants. Um, actually, all across Africa, there's a big issue with, with certain species. Um, what we struggle with in my region of the world, uh, the Western Cape and the Eastern Cape where I'm from originally, is specifically uh, woody biomass. So Australian trees um, really... Firstly, um, having an adverse effect on local flora, so on our fainbos biomes, um, inhibiting the growth thereof. And secondly, as being a water scarce country, really having a large effect on what water is available. So uh, when we face day zero in Cape Town, one of the most effective measures that we can take to improve our water security in South Africa is to make a plan with all these invasive trees from Australia, which are water gazelles. And then lastly, a big issue that they're causing as well is an increased risk of fire. So we've got, a, we've got natural fire cycles, uh, in, which is good for our local vegetation. But with these thick woody biomass um, trees, they cause more intense wildfires. So in essence, 
which was supposed to be a natural cycle, is becoming more and more um, harmful, obviously having a, a large effect on climate change. So our carbon capture initial project that we developed was looking at um, what is the business as usual case when it comes to clearing of invasive species, which in essence is to cut them down, to sell them as firewood. We love to barbecue or bry as we call it in South Africa. So that's usually what it's used for. Um, or it's just used as mulch, or sometimes it's just stacked and burned because it, it poses a fire risk in itself. We thought, how do we, how do we change this model? So we developed a program um, where we are measuring the clearing of, the, uh, of invasive species, which in itself we picked up was an issue that there was no real data and um, working towards solving this issue at scale. There were piecemeal strategies, but nothing that actually really addressed it uh, in a coherent manner. Then we looked at um, biochar. I didn't know what biochar was three years ago, and I didn't believe my business partner that is when we actually discovered how amazing biochar is. I think I am converted now to realize that biochar really is an amazing resource. Um, and I think the great thing about biochar is through the pyrolysis process, it can be manufactured in a low-tech environment through low-tech kilns. So that was really appealing. Uh, and then the last part of this program that we've developed is also uh, restoring the indigenous vegetation as part of that. Um, we implemented a great pro program on Rainic Organic Wine, which is a, a fully biodynamic farm. And the farmer, Johan Reineke himself, is very committed to the process. So that is ongoing. So it's, it's a project to take an existing um, negative resource and turn it into something that we can use to mitigate climate change. That's, that's the basis of our big carbon, carbon capture project here. And just as you were uh, describing the projects that you are involved in, uh, measuring, measuring carbon uh, capture and other services, um, you did mention that uh, the landowners were involved in it. So it seems like you are actively involving the local stakeholders and the local community. So how do you find that they're responding to it? Are there, what are the impacts that you find that these projects are having on their livelihoods? Um, yeah, so, so there's, there's a big program to, to empower people to take part in biomass beneficiation, which is a part of this value chain. Um, I think a big drive for us, which, which started this is, obviously everybody's interested in the carbon market at this stage and, and the ability of the carbon market to address climate change. So everybody, we as well, started with looking at the market. That's the focus. Our focus was the market. If we look at the South African carbon tax, um, What's being recognized currently is the big voluntary carbon market standards, the recognized ones, which are the, the most prevalent. Those are the only um, standards that are that are recognized in terms of offsetting. But what we realized through the process was that in order to access those markets, the scale of the project needed to be huge because the costs of, of monitoring, reporting, and verification, the cost of submitting your project idea note, which we went through the whole process, we just realized this is something that couldn't scale in Africa. Um, and secondly, it was reliant on consultants which weren't in Africa. So it was re re reliant on um, companies outside of where we are actually working. So the real drive behind it was to see how do we create low-tech tools um, and digital tools through using technology which is freely available um, and utilize that so that people can empower themselves to measure the impact that they're having. So our whole theory is that we want to create end-to-end -end digital processes to say that um, instead of creating a grant application or submitting a project idea note and then waiting for somebody to tell you, was this good enough? How, how far, how close were you to actually accessing funding? You say that, let's do it bottom up. Let's say, these are the things that you need to um, adhere to. This is what you need to comply with. And then help somebody through that whole process to implement the project, um, measure the impact that they're having, and then also verify it. So it's still very early stage. and um, me being out of the business world, I'm very mindful of testing my assumptions. So we've, we're taking it step by step. We're being iterative, um, but it's having a real impact on, on people on, on the ground. And the team that we're working with, um, they, yeah, they're very into the biochar thing. And we see massive potential. I think we are on the, the cusp of a big wave that can break open uh, when it comes to biochar and, and turning invasive species into biochar. So we're very excited about changing people's lives or helping people change their own lives in that, in that instance. Yeah, so you mentioned, um, yeah, that they are, that the st local stakeholders are very involved um, and they're into it actually. So how about the local communities around? Do you think that they, how do they perceive, and I know that you also worked already on some 
urban farming uh, pro projects. So how do the local communities around these projects tend to respond to all of this? Yeah, I, I think in, in South Africa, it's interesting because we've got, we've got work, a tale of two countries. We've, we've got privileged people that form the minority of the country, and then we've got a majority of very underprivileged people. And what usually tends to happen as well is we've got a Western legal system, uh, Roman Dutch with the common law influence. We've got systems of indigenous law, but they were implemented at the uh, start of the 20th century, end of the 19th century. So in essence, these were interpretations of indigenous law by Western um, scholars. There's amazing work being done to think about what are indigenous knowledge systems, um, what are indigenous systems of land ownership, but there's a big clash between, between these systems. So what we found when we started our projects going in very much is due diligence is a very important aspect of it and ask and explaining to communities what land tenure means. What does it mean to own property? Because there's a big mismatch with what is ownership in reality and what people perceive to be ownership on the ground. So I think that's the first thing that needs to be addressed in our country is to, is to empower people to say that, do you currently have legal ownership and legal, legal tenure? Are you empowered to do something, to implement a project? But secondly, when they aren't, to not shy away from that because that's what we're currently doing. When we're looking the other way, when people don't have uh, ownership of their property, when they're not um, complying with legislation, but to really take a hard look at ourselves as a country and as, and as communities to say, how do we bridge these gaps? How do we empower people to take this forward. We've got an amazing legal system. We've got an amazing constitution. We should employ that to really start thinking about what does it mean to employ indigenous knowledge um, as part of these systems that we're implementing. So I think, I think that's also very early days. Um, but as I said, I think there is, there's a, for the first time in our history, there's a real recognition that we really have to take a deep look at our past and a deep look at the legal systems, which enable systems of ownership, uh, land, land use and planning, all these type of systems. So that forms a big part of what of the work that we do is to really st speak to communities and understand what is their understanding of, of what they need and what makes them feel empowered as well, because uh, it's, a, it's a big thing that I think is missed a lot of the time. It does seem from your last uh, reply that you are really taking a look at the system itself. It's sort of like the system, you would say, you could almost say that the system is somehow wrong or broken a little bit and that you've spent a lot of time uh, looking at it. And I do understand that the next question I'm gonna ask is very difficult, very broad, but uh, throughout uh, your experience working with these communities, what are the main problems that you actually see with the system? And how, is there any way that you feel like they could be addressed that is not um, overwhelming, let's say? Yeah, it's, so, I think I think the the biggest crime and well I can't say this I can't say this is the biggest crime because there's so many crimes in South African history but one of the biggest ones yeah <laughs> let's let's skip that landmine for now but in my opinion one of the the worst things that happened in our history was really um, the complete marginalisation of indigenous knowledge systems to to make people understand that it somehow is a lesser system of law or a lesser system of knowledge um, and what I've discovered. Um, in my life is there's so much value in African knowledge. There's um, when it comes to community and uh, me being from the Eastern Cape, if you read the history of the, is it closer and what, what the, the, the missionaries, when they did, they did a lot of wrong, but they actually recorded a, a lot of real history as to what, what these systems were of um, interacting with each other. I think the loss of that is for me, something that we must look at and, really from a from a place of power try and recapture and i think steve biko and robert sabuko were, were people that did that they were able to blend effective systems of western knowledge with indigenous knowledge systems and really just come up with these amazing inspiring um, systems of thinking and of power and that inspires that can inspire any south african regardless of what their background is uh, firstly and um I think secondly, it's, it's really to deeply listen to what, what people feel. And, and unfortunately, South Africa is still so divided along cultural and, and racial lines. So really to think about how do people feel about the fact that they are stuck in poverty and that there's no way out. And the last point, which is something that is a real problem in South Africa, is the education system at this stage. Um, 
it was as if the new South Africa, meaning um, the de democratic South Africa in 1994 started. And it was such a focus on academic knowledge to say that you need to go to university. Um, and we kind of like shifted the goals, goalposts to get there and um, really let a lot of our vocational and technical knowledge go. And I think that's a big, it's a big missed opportunity. And we're all talking about the fourth industrial revolution now and really thinking about new skills. And I think what I've realized working with Europeans um, is South Africa can, re uh, it's not South Africa, Africa can stand on its own when it comes to digital technologies and really being innovative in that space. So I think Africa can be a real leader there and we should um, give ourselves the space to, to do that and, and re reestablish our, our value in that sense as well. Merging what's, what's part of the land with, what we can discover now with digital technologies as well. Just for the sake of, of painting a picture, this is a question we've been asking also almost uh, all of our interviewees. Um, you did mention education and is there an educational element to any of your activities about spreading any kind of information, even if it is on digital technologies and how they can help you? You asked me earlier about, about our, urban farm, uh, our urban farming program, which I kind of like missed completely. So as I said, we started in 2019 and we implemented a number of projects in a number of communities. Um, one of the first things that I learned, and this is education and listening, just to, to circle back to that, was going to a community with a solution is absolutely the wrong approach or the chances of it succeeding in the long term, being a lasting solution are, are very slim. So it's, when it comes to education, it's about really listening to communities, saying what what is it that you need, and that's what we're trying to incorporate. So, <clears throat> we've developed an uh, urban farming program. So, really to look at how do you implement a small scale regenerative program from start to finish by having a digital process, and um, we've incorporated all the lessons that we've learned into this. So, that starts with due diligence. Do you own the property that you want to do this? Do you have consent from your local government? If you don't, how do we get there? And um, what, what rights do you need? Do you, have, do you have enough water? Really going through a very simple due diligence process and then um, empowering people to, to work towards that educational element. And not there's so many open source resources available at the moment. Um, if we look at what the European Union has done with measuring the impact of nature-based solutions, that practitioner's guidebook, that's a really great reference for anybody to use. Um, and then in South Africa, we've got... Um, COPAC, I can't remember what the acronym stands for, but it really is a cooperative organization that really takes a hard look at saying, how are you going to make this successful? What do you need for your community to support something? So those resources, we've incorporated them into our programs and, and it's, it's open source. We can refer back to that anytime that we need to. Um, but it's also about being honest and being really frank about what's needed. And I think that's for me is being responsible in, in creating impact, whether it's social or environmental impact, is about honesty because it's about telling somebody as quickly as possible to say that if you think you're going to make money out of this project, these are your chances. This is what you can do incrementally. If you're thinking you're going to make 100,000 rands out of a small plot, you might be able to if you can create an awesome value added product and you can get your community to support you. But the, the chances and the reality on the ground are very slim. So how do we cross those bridges and how do we get to that? So I think that's the educational element of our program is how do we empower communities to, to have answers, to think about these are my assumptions. How do I get the answers? And, um, and sometimes we have to be that bridge. And that's where I love the fact that I've got a legal background because we've worked with communities, um, specifically Rastafarian communities that are very marginalized. Um, they, they form an amazing part of our history. And I think one of the most touching things for me was we worked with this community. They were farming on a piece of land that was granted to them informally by the municipality. And one day it was just taken away. And just the, that interaction really highlighted the plight that we work with of, of people feeling that they're not valued. Um, and us empowering or me coming up and saying, well, you do have constitutional rights. These are your rights. And then I think one of the, the most... Um, one of the community members told me, he said, JP, uh, he said, I'm not an alien. And I think that was one of the most touching things to me because the fact that people still feel like aliens in their own country um, in the new South Africa is, is, is a perpetuating crime that we need to address. So that's part of the educational element to equip people with those tools to, 
to, to take the fight forward if they need to. No, it does seem like you're working very in depth, trying to understand all of the issues and really work very closely with people. Um, and it, it's actually very interesting to hear you describe the, the process. And if you wouldn't mind going a little bit more into that, it would be interesting to hear like how long does a process like this take, just getting to know the community, uh, understanding their needs and helping them implement a program, um, going uh, through the process of implementing the program with them and helping them with the digital technologies. Like, can you describe that a little bit more? Yeah, I can, I can describe it as to the mistakes we've made and now we're hopefully we're not making mistakes anymore. So the, one of the first projects we did, um, we came in, we said, this is the solution. Let's create an urban farm. At an at a area, we had all, we had, we did the basic due diligence, but as we went along, we realized this might not be the need of the community is an urban farm. They were actually, when we had Mandela Day there, which was an amazing experience in itself, um, when I actually visited the people in their homes, I said, we should have maybe focused on fixing their roofs, which are leaky every um, winter with damp and real other health issues. Because we were coming in saying, look, oh, the community is going to eat these healthy vegetables and they're going to be healthy. But we didn't even think about what are the what are the knock why are they unhealthy is it food or it could it be another reason so that's i think that's the first one so that's that's what we learned out of that process and then the organization that we work with now in jamestown is in stanbosch uh, usiko they decided they wanted to start a regenerative farm and we just came along on the journey to say how do you measure that so that was the start of the process they already were willing to do it themselves and we are partners. We're not, we are absolute partners in this venture now. Um, so, so that that process, it's continuing. It never stops. Actually, I think that's the that's the big lesson. There's no start and no end. There's hopefully a point where we can just pull out and say, wow, you've established the conditions to have a thriving enterprise. So I think um the way what I, it took me a while to get to this point, but what we address are three points and we try and keep it simple. So I've said it, it's about, is it legal? I keep referring to due diligence, but that is a really important point because you can't access funding if you're doing something which is either in a gray area or illegal, unfortunately. Um, even if we don't agree with the law, that's just the way the cookie crumbles and banks aren't going to look at you. Um, we, we look at, is it legal? Then we look at, it, is, it, um, is it legitimate? I, I, in my mind, I say legit because that's why we say, talk in South Africa according to slang. I said, is it legitimate? And what that means is, can you defend the, what this project is? Can I honestly say this is having a real impact and I'm happy with the process? And is it legitimate in the eyes of the community? Do they really like feel we need this? We love this. We want to take this forward. And I think the last point is, is, is it lasting? And what I apply there is the principles of lean impact. Uh, and May Chang, an amazing book. Anybody that's interested in, in thinking about creating lasting impact, I would refer to that. Um, and that says you need to test three hypotheses. Is it value? Do people value it? Can it grow? So can it scale? Is it, and that also refers to, is it sustainable financially? And then lastly, is it having impact? And is it relentlessly seeking to have more and more impact? Are we falling in love with the problem we're addressing and not the solution that we're proposing? So those three points, and we continue to go through that circle as much as possible. And then, as I said, with, with the urban farm, and with the work that Usiko is doing, Usiko takes people into the wilderness and tells them, and this is what I realize as an attorney, is pe sometimes people just need to somebody to tell them you are valued or you are an individual or you are okay or you are not even amazing. You just are a person. Um, and that's what Usiko is doing in, in a big way in the community and, and really um, working relentlessly to, to empower their community and, and the broader South Africa. So we're very excited about the project and to keep on going through the cycles of them. And I'm, I'm very hopeful. Yeah, it's that seems like a wonderful initiative, really. And I, I would like to ask, so if this process is a lot focused on things that work, uh, different solutions that work in different places according to what's needed the most. So the, the carbon capture or removal solution will not be the same everywhere. Um, how scalable does your, is our solution? Do you think that it's easy to implement it in other locations around the world? I, I, um, I think it is to, to an extent. So, so projects we're working on at the moment that are absolutely about carbon capture is 
it's the biochar project. So taking an existing, so so we look at we're looking at the wine industry in South Africa where there are a lot of controlled burns, uh, where the vineyards are taken out every year and then they are literally just burnt. So that's business as usual cases to burn it. Um, and there are a number of industries in Africa and in South Africa that that you can apply that to. So for us, the big focus, as I said in the past, it was really trying to get into the market where we are focusing now is how do you enable somebody to do it in essence to capture carbon. And how do, how do we get them to prove it as cheaply and as efficiently as possible? So how do we decrease the cost of establishing trust? We call that principle um, minimum decentralized proof. So what is the optimal amount of data you need, minimum, uh, decentralized, more than one, um, more than one person that's, that's actually attesting to the fact that it happened, um, and hopefully decentralized storage in future as well, but that's a story for another day. And then also proof, just how do you establish that trust? But how is there proof? And... Where I look at it from a legal point of view, it's it's um, using the Anglo system, um, the common law system. It's about doing that um, on a balance of probabilities. So on a balance of probabilities, using the old legal standard to say, on a balance of probabilities, do we believe this has happened? And these days with remote sensing technology, I think that's the really amazing thing that you can take a satellite photo. And I think what digital technology is doing and I can I can phone you on WhatsApp now. We can have a, a video. We're having a video call right now. So if I find something in Africa and somebody can phone me and actually show me where it is, and I can second factor authenticate it with a satellite, I think that just changes the game completely. So we believe it's scalable, but you will always need to take local context into into consideration and local laws. Um, even in South Africa, when we look at, and I keep referring back to ownership of property, but that's a very important point. Um, We've got indigenous legal systems where people don't have tenure. Uh, we've got the Ngonyama Trust in Kozuru Natal, which is a large trust where a lot of people live, millions of people live, but it's, they don't own the property and they can never access title, which I'm not saying is what they need to do, but you need to think about those systems when you're implementing solutions. And on the point of, of urban farming, I think what some of the EU frameworks around carbon farming have been really instructed to say, Sometimes a results-based or outcomes-based system might not be appropriate. And I think specifically in Africa, when it comes to soil carbon and soil health, we need to be encouraging practice. We need to be saying, do this. We will obviously try and measure the outcome as efficiently as possible in future by measuring soil organic carbon and other indicators of soil. But we need to get people to build up the soil because that's a big issue. Um, whether it's in rural areas of South Africa or in Lesotho, for instance, I had a call last that week with somebody there. It's a massive issue. Um, people will lose the ability to create food um, or grow food, rather, um, if we don't look into that. So I think, yes, what we are working on is, is, is scalable. It's built to be scalable. It's built to use the optimal amount of technology and data to prove something. But you will always need to take local um, context into account. And I hope this question might be a little bit redundant, maybe, but well, I'm going to ask it anyway. Um, so you you obviously created this this process and this tool um, for the African reality because the all of the other ones that were available to access all of this new carbon funding weren't working um, and were basically inaccessible. Uh, but do you think that what you're doing for Africa could easily be brought to other continents and maybe even to smaller projects? Because the reality is that I find that smaller grassroots projects have problems accessing funding everywhere and that that monitoring takes massive amounts of energy everywhere even for small projects for for big projects i mean so you think that your what you're bringing to the table could could help in, in different other different contexts even absolutely but um i think that's the amazing thing of the of the age we live in uh, apart from all the bad things about it is really the world has become very small. And what we've been doing, and I've not actually mentioned the, the, the platform that we're building currently, it's called the Ecola Impact Platform. And that is, as I said, it's about building a digital process from application to verification to help some, because that was our experience. It was, it's, the equity was not just about not being able to access funding. The equity is about not getting a straight answer as to there's a massive grant opens and all of these, you have to have this massive scale, which is, in essence, impossible almost in, in Africa. And secondly, unlocking the existing funding sources take months to years. The, I was part of the Biodiversity Partners Program and, and a big 
project in Mozambique took 10 years to unlock. That literally is time which we don't have at this stage. So we really need to encourage as many projects as possible. What I've learned from the European systems, where they started looking at local methodologies for, for carbon, was really about, um, I always refer back to Moore Futures. I think that was one of the best ones that started because they took a local varsity, a local university with a local government, and they created their own peatlands project. And I think that's the, when the penny dropped for me about the voluntary carbon market, saying it's, if, you, if I trust it and I'm willing to fund it, then that's all we need at this stage. And that's the whole thing. It's about really thinking about local projects. And, and I think universities and knowledge institutions are underutilized in, in this process where we can, you can lean on local universities to help you verify it. And then if you've got a local community that believes that this has happened and you can prove it, that's in essence what we need to be establishing is that link. And that's what we're trying to do with the Ecola Impact Platform. So Yes, it's the same process everywhere. I, I was very, and, and I'll, I'll refer to this quickly because I think it's important, is when I st we started, I told people um, carbon is carbon and Africa's got this amazing opportunity to do this. And then I read an article about crypto colonialism, which is actually saying that we must be very mindful also not to appropriate land in Africa for a new form of colonialism to enable people in another part of the world to just keep on doing what they're doing. Because Africa is not the problem when it comes to climate change, let's be honest. I think that's a big part of it as well. We shouldn't miss that. So talking about the carbon market, very important, an opportunity for Africa. But um, unfortunately, the rest of the world needs to take a massive haircut as well when it comes to the lifestyle. And that's, that's actually the very difficult thing. So I, don't, I unfortunately don't have an answer for that at this stage. But that's also something that we really need to think about. Yeah, okay. So now with this... Um, and that's where we're talking about the system, obviously. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. Yeah, but now with this kind of food for thought left in the air, I'm going to ask you, um, do you feel hopeful about this whole climate crisis situation? Do you feel that with what you're bringing that we can come out of it positively um, despite all of these challenges? I, I feel hopeful that the tools are there to have honest conversations and honest, honest strategies, which we're not seeing at the moment. So I'm not hopeful about the way, the trajectory where we're going. I think if we look at something like the Net Zero Initiative, Carbon 4, the work that Carbon Market Watch is doing, that makes me very hopeful because that's, we're starting to have the real conversations about global contributions to climate change mitigation and the fact that you can't, it's, it's not an accounting exercise. It's not a Net Zero game. It really is a global game. That's the first one. And then, on a more holistic level, if we look at the donut, I think that's a that's a that's a real thing we can that we can utilize. And then also um, something somebody I've not reached out to formally, but the Future Fit Business Benchmark, I think that's an amazing tool. That if we can get more companies on board using that, more more countries talking about it in that manner and thinking about the larger systemic uh, impact that you're having and how do you start talking about that? About firstly. The first thing you need to do is draw the line in the sand and say, what are these goals, the break-even goals? Where can't I even transgress? And then start talking about positive pursuits and really framing it in that way. So that makes me very hopeful that we've, we've got all the tools to do it. Um, the world just needs to be preoccupied with the right stuff. I think that's, that's where we need to go. But I'm, I am hopeful. Great. So for all of those watching that might be hopeful like you and feel driven to do something about it. So how could people um, maybe get involved, support you or um, yeah, support the cause really? Yeah, I, I think um, I think the best place is to, is to reach out on our LinkedIn. Um, that's an amazing resource in itself. That makes me hopeful because it's amazing here you can just reach out to these days. A lot of them don't respond, but some people do respond. And it's like, it's it's been insane. Like what we've been able to, accomplish out of our small little corner in the southern tip of Africa. So I think please reach out on LinkedIn, um, African Data Technologies, or you can check our website. It's africandata.tech. Okay. Thank you so much for being here today, Jean-Pierre. And thank you for sharing all of these wonderful insights from the African reality, which I think many times is uh, still kept out of the conversation, unfortunately. And to everyone watching, uh, if you are interested in learning more, we are going to drop all of the links in the description. Scroll down for the African Data Technologies 
website and LinkedIn, and also to some of the resources that Jean-Pierre has been talking about, uh, like the Lean Impact, Future Fit Business, and um, more. So thank you again, uh, Jean-Pierre. Awesome. Thanks so much, Karina. Thank you.